of the Rules and Open Government Committee to order at 2.01 p.m. Let's have a roll call. Davis? Here. Jimenez? Present. Kamei? Here. Foley? Here. Cohen? Here. Cap Corm. All right, we're going to start with a review of the January 30th agenda. <coughs> this one has a 9.30 closed session and 1.30 regular session. Consent starts on page four, continues on page five and six. And then uh, section six, we have a reach code update for EVs, uh, the non-issuance, uh, non-exclusive franchise agreements issuance on 6.2 on page seven, animal care annual report on page eight. Oh, I'm gonna need to refer that one. And section uh, eight on page eight, also regulating oversized vehicles, and then addressing encampments and oversized vehicles around schools. And there is land use consent, which would be heard immediately after consent. So let's start with public comment. No hands raised at this time. Oh yeah, um, is that next week too? Sir, okay. He's got a question. <laughs> Go ahead, uh, Councilmember Jimenez. A lot going on. Um, <laughs> what, I, what I was hoping is whoever makes the motion, happy to make the motion, but uh, we can make 8.1, 8.2 the uh, uh, the uh, large vehicle items. The, um, sorry, the uh, hold on. Oversized vehicle items, 8.1 and 8.2. We can make them time certain at 4. I think that'd be helpful for some of the folks who want to come out and speak to it. Okay. And Councilmember Davis? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to make the motion. I want to refer 7.1 back to NSE for the, um, I think, the March meeting. Let me make sure. Um, before, it, before it comes to council. Okay, so is that, a, you wanna make the overall motion? Actually, let me just ask first before we do that. Um, first of all, if we do the time certain and we, and we defer item 7.1, we have two items. I know the reach code item will have some discussion that will take some time. Um, we, we have, a, we have a, a chance of a, of a break in the afternoon if we do it and have it at four o'clock. Is, is, but you wanna, is four o'clock the time, specific time that you're looking for or? Um, I'd be able, I mean, any time around there, I mean, are you thinking of... No, I'm I, just I, trying to figure out what's the right time given the, the load on the agenda. Um, They're already going to be last. Yes, it will be last. Um, he just doesn't want it to start too early so that people don't aren't here, I guess, is what you're worried about, is if we started at 3.30 that people would not be ready. Correct. Um, I, think, I think if we started at 4, I think it's naturally going to go into early evening anyway. Um, and so we'll capture some of those people at the tail end also. Could, but I, I appreciate, I appreciate wanting to have people here who may be working who want to be, uh, come and talk about that issue. But I'm also sensitive to our time. We only have one issue really, and that's the, the reach codes. That's going to have some conversation, not a huge conversation. And if we start at one, our meeting starts at 1.30, we're likely going to have a big break between, or a break, between finishing that item, consensus, and then moving into the the two items that you referred to, 6.2 and, or six, whatever. Eight, eight, one, eight, whatever eight, so, so eight, I mean, I, I, I think eight, three, 330 is fine, 3 would be better. I hear what you want to do. Um, but it also, I think we're going to have a big break because of just the one item. Can we plug in the study session? I think, Lee, if you can. So we could, <coughs> we could put the uh, fees and charges as well as the preliminary forecast study session that was scheduled for yesterday there to, to fill that gap. I would agree that there probably will be a gap if we wait until four. 
um, but the administration also does have an alternative for the rules committee to consider for that study session as well. Yeah, let me ask about that study session then. Yeah. So there's two, there were two parts of that study session, the fees and charges and the preliminary. We could divide those into two parts as well, couldn't we? Yes, you absolutely could. Our thought is on the fees and charges. Um, when we start budget study sessions with you in May, that we do a deeper dive into fees and charges before those you know, study sessions kick off. It probably would be more times appropriate. And then also on your agenda today, item, um, I believe it's uh, D1, yeah, the, the priority setting. I think the preliminary forecast discussion, we could do a part of that as part of the discussion around priorities for um, the March budget message that's currently outlined um, by Cal or, um, Mayor Mahan and Councilmember Davis. So we could split those two up and just not have one full-blown study session if the Rules Committee would like. Okay. <clears throat> and, you know, doing the math on the timing here, we would probably get through consent around 2.15 usually each week. So if we start EV reach code at 2.15 and chances are it's an hour discussion, we could have as much as a 45-minute break. Um, so that's, I guess that's the question about whether we want to try to avoid that. Um, what about 3.30? Yeah, I mean, so we can say 3.30 times certain. I, of course, times certain means we stop whatever stop we're doing it. and do that then. And so we also run opposite risks, although I, you know, I, don't, I don't know. Um, or just means whatever it comes first after 3.30, I guess is what that probably not means. Before not, before, not, before, not before 3.30. Not before 3.30. That's fine. Okay, so we'll say not before 3.30. That way we're safe without a break. Okay. Okay, so, so go ahead I'll, and make I'll move the agenda for <clears throat> Tuesday, January 30th, 30th, including the ad sheet um, and deferring item 7.1 with a referral to NSE for March and um, making 8.1 and 8.2 to be heard not before 3.30. Second. All right, so we have a motion and a second, so let's vote. Is it? Okay, let's just, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? All right, that motion carries 5-0. Let's move on to our review of the meeting for Tuesday, February 6th. This one has a 9.30 closed session, 1.30 regular session, and a study session built into the afternoon um, meeting, which we can discuss when it comes time. Um, consent starts on page four, continues through pages five, uh, through page five, and ends on the top of page six. In section three, we have the uh, council questions for the prospective director of aviation, uh, violent prevention service models status update. Um, and then in section four, we have a policy on catalytic converger, converters. And section six, a um, power mix and rates event, uh, item. Section eight, VTA agreement for interim housing at Cerrone. And weed the weed abatement commencement report. And we have a successor agency for redevelopment item to be heard immediately after consent. So let's go to public on this. Paul? Uh, good afternoon, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I'd like to speak about the items that are on the consent calendar. You have sidewalk repairs and you have tree planting. Uh, thank you, Google, that's nice, nice gesture. Um, I, want, uh, I want the racial equity office involved in this conversation and I'd like them to be taken off consent. I think we need to say, I know that this is just a scheduling because the meeting's in, in May, but the racial equity office is impotent. They're not being utilized for the purpose by which it was created. I was in on the creation of that office. It, it happened immediately after uh, 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 Stephen PD's complete comprehensive view of what life has been like for the Mexican here in San Jose. And it was... I mean, I would be embarrassed to be on the city council, have that said, and then not do anything about that, not follow that through or follow that up. 
but it just gives us an indication of like, you know, how much you care about what goes on with the Mexican and the Chicano experience here in San Jose. So what I'd like to see is I'd want to see a racial equity component attached to the sidewalk repairs and the tree planting. I want those trees planted in barrios that have been neglected historically. I want the sidewalks prioritized so that the seniors, when they're trying to walk to the store or they're using walkers, that they're, that they're not tripping and falling. I mean, we don't really know or have been able to assess how many falls have happened on sidewalks in those barrios because they're, they're just not going to they're, they're not going to call the police. They don't do what Anglos do. They just don't do it. We just will go ahead and we deal with it ourselves. So that's what I want to see. I want to see the racial equity office give an assessment of where the need is, and then you allocate the funds accordingly. I'd also like violence redefined. You have violence on there, violence prevention. I want a full definition of what violence is because poverty is also violence against the people. Back to the committee. All right, thank you. And um, just in this, in this agenda, we have the um, study session for arts, uh, what do we think the length of that study, Lee, what do we think, how long do we think the, that study session is supposed to what it would be? Uh, depending on public comment and council discussion, it could be anywhere from an hour to two hours. Okay. Um, so you do, you do as a rules committee as well on consent, you are releasing the February 16th study session date. <laughs> so the rules committee could decide not to have that study session on council day and, and put it on that Friday, February 16th in the morning. That's an option. Um, another option, I mean, I'm just looking at a schedule. This doesn't strike me as a very long agenda. I don't know how long the power rates discussion will be or the uh, catalytic converters one will be, but it could be a fairly quick agenda. But let's, mm -hmm. let's hear what others have to say on uh, Councilmember Davis. Yeah, I just, um, I mean, we can, we can try it a second time, but <laughs> I, I just really have concerns about trying to put it trying to squeeze a study session into a, a regular council day. Um, I'm fine with, again, trying it a second time, but after this, I don't think we should release the 16th, just in case. Um, and, and after this, I think we should stop trying to do that if it doesn't work, honestly. Thank you, Councilmember Foley. Uh, frankly, it didn't work yesterday, and I'm concerned it's not going to work in two weeks because we do get in a meeting and we we don't know what will be an issue that brings a lot of public comment nor do we know which particular issue is going to bring in a lot of comments from our council colleagues which could have the conversation go on so uh, i appreciate council member davis suggesting to try it again but i'd rather uh, just be, 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 two things. One, I think we need to give the subject its due discussion. And if we're in the middle of a council meeting it, that is running long, it, we won't have that opportunity. Plus, the advocates who will be coming in connection with that arts, the arts study session, should be prepared and aware that we're going to be potentially running late or um, tired by the time we finally get to the item, depending on how late the day goes. So I would prefer uh, that we retain the study session in February and make that the arts uh, study session. And with that, I would move the agenda and exclude the study session for the arts. Do you want me to include moving it to the 16th, 20? I don't know if that's the... Or do I do that later? Or pull it off consent? I think, I think that should be understood. I don't think that's really about this agenda, right? Or, okay. I, I mean, just... Yeah. The I message, so. I don't... I don't want the, the arts community to think we're pulling it because we don't want to hear the subject. Right, right. Understood. I think that... When, we're pull, we, when we get to the consent calendar for today's meeting, we'll have to pull the item that, yeah. that uh, releases that date. And so we'll, we'll mention it at that time. Okay. Uh, Vice Mayor Kamei? Um, I, I agree with uh, Council Member Foley. I think that um, uh, when, when, we're, when we're having our regular meeting, it may or may not go over. We may have more uh, speakers or involvement. And I think that um, we ought to have a focused 
uh, give it the give it the attention that it deserves on the arts and you know I think that it's nice to have if we're able to together however I don't see it and I also see that people will wait for a very long time and you know we're exhausted they've been sitting here for a long time for the advocates and you know I just think that it'd be better if it was separate and we could give it the attention it deserves Yes, I, I, I um, well, I think next week's meeting, this meeting on the 6th differs in the sense that from yesterday, because yesterday we had a land use evening session, so it was, to me, tougher that we were ever gonna make that work. But having said that, I think it, the, the argument that, um, that have, when we have a study session, the topic is important enough that we focus on that topic and don't try to rush it in the, in the context of a full agenda makes, uh, makes a compelling case. So I will support the motion and uh, let's vote on it. The system working out. Yes. All right. The motion carries five zero, and I'm going to apologize because I forgot to notice that there's an ad sheet for next week's council meeting. I so, added it. oh, you did. Yeah. Okay. Oh, See, you noticed, and I didn't even hear what you said. All right. Thank you. Somebody's on the ball. <laughs> All right. Next item is our consent calendar um, on the uh, rules agenda. We have uh, five items. Oh, actually, seven items today on consent. We will start with public comment. Blair? Hi, Blair Beekman. I haven't been around a while, but I've been watching and, and uh, you know, listening to uh, your, your council committee meetings. Um, on the public record today, I found it interesting. There was a lot of varied uh, different public comment on different items, uh, different ideas and thoughts of, of subject matter of San Jose. It was, uh, and the world, basically. It was really interesting and a uh, good experience. So, so thank you for it, and uh, it's ni nice to see a good, uh, a lot of people uh, participating in, in public record this week with, with different ideas and thoughts. Thank you. Paul? Uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Once again, you're gonna have the city budget. Now, the Racial Equity Office was instituted in order to ensure that racial equity was not an aspiration. It, it, it's, it's not something that we're aspiring to. Racial, the component of racial equity is this, is that the reasons why it is so important to have racial equity is because of the historical racial inequities that we already all agree have happened. Now, we don't want your rhetoric. Your rhetoric is worthless. Your memos and your, your, your resolutions are worthless. Those are pieces of paper with black ink on them. That's all it's worth. You can't get that and take it to a kid on the east side and give it to him, and he can take that and go get some kind of service with it. He can't do it. So it's a worthless piece of paper. So either 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 cut out the racial equity office and just just abolish it and and just get it out of there because it's taking up too much of a budget or start really actually instituting it exactly where it was meant and created to be instituted and that is in the budgets and what i mean by that is this if uh if of district if district 10 or district 5 or district 4 whatever the districts that have really um, obtain the most resources historically? If there's $10,000 in a pot, each person gets $1,000. Nope, each of the 10 districts don't get $1,000. The ones that have historically been deprived of those resources, they're gonna get the most. And in the one, in district six and district one and all these other districts, they're gonna get maybe 400 bucks. And the rest of that pot is gonna go to the districts that most need it because they are the ones that have been most neglected and all of that money is up. Back to the committee. All right, uh, Council Member Foley. I would like to pull uh, item one from the consent and move the rest of the consent. Second. Okay, well, let's vote. I think the motion carried five, oh, four zero, because uh, Jimenez has stepped out. Um, and just and we're not really pulling I that item, we're just approving we're consent not. without that item right. and moving on. All right, so we'll move on to 
our first uh, action item for Did today. Do we want to assign this? Oh, I don't. Do, that we, date? do we have to assign? Rochelle, do we need to have the Rules Committee assign the Arts Commission to that 16th right now? I think you can. The I, committee can. It's not agendized, so we probably need to do, we'll do a memorandum and, and put that on consent for Rules Committee for next, next rules. week for based next, off okay. of this conversation. Okay. So we can do that. Okay. So we don't need, we could do it now. And just I think because it's not agendized, okay. Kevin will stand up and say stuff if we try and do that. Well, we want him to say stuff, but we don't want him to stand up and be <laughs> mad at us. Okay. Thank you. Kevin, you're always so quiet. We wanted to have to you do something while you're here, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. Earn your so credit, <laughs> Kevin. Come on. Uh, item C1. Um, this is scheduling the budget priority study session for the March budget message on February 13th on a council meeting agenda day. <laughs> uh, council Member Davis, you have anything you want to say about this? We put this memo in before um, the, the failed study session uh, on a council day. Um, so this is really just to make it clear that we wanna have a budget priority uh, study session in advance of the March message, and then also the, um, the budget forecast stuff to be included in that as well, as we mentioned earlier. So if we don't wanna have it on the 13th, um, I'm wondering if we need to move the arts and actually have this one on the 16th now that I'm, the gears are turning. Before we move on, I mean, Lee and I talked about the schedule. I think the meeting on the 13th is being left open so we can do the study session, but let's let Lee address that. That is correct. So not, not that um, I would expect you guys to look that far out on the Horizon Report, but we've actually kept that with the exception of a, a tougher hearing that we absolutely need to do. That agenda is completely blank with the exception of two okay. items, one being the mid-year budget, which is relatively straightforward, um, our focus area Q2 update. So both of those are actually pretty pertinent to this item. So yep. we would just do all three of those items together in one day. Okay. And I, I think contextually, it, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, great. Okay, so let's go to public comment. Paul? Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Again, racial equity. I'm not going to stop on that. I'm going to continue harping until I get what it is that we have coming. And what we have coming is for there to be an economic, an economic uh, metric that is used in every single department. Because there isn't a department in this city that isn't infected with racist policies. Because what we've done as a community is we have normalized that. And there is no council member on this committee that ever can point to me and tell me that this is the day when it stopped and this is the day when a whole new budget allocations in order to directly address these historical injustices that the Vargos have experienced generationally as a result of redlining. There is nothing that you can point to me where that has happened. Now, I'm a citizen of Salsi Puedes. I am a descendant of Salsi Puedes. I have lived my entire life with those policies. School to prison pipeline, school to prison pipeline, hell, 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 being locked up because of council members. And there's a council member right here that's listening to my voice that he attempted to have me locked up. He failed to be locked up. So this is the kind of injustices that have been experienced in the city, and I'm sick of it. I'm sick of those injustices, and you need to start doing something about it. You really need to start doing something about it because we're not going to sit here and continue looking at your smiling faces and your smug remarks and how comfortable you are. That's, that's what's the most disgusting part about this economically is that how comfortable you are sitting there knowing that these historical injustices have, have happened, you have the power to do something about it, and you do absolutely nothing. That's why somebody like me in the community is absolutely necessary. So I want the racial equity office, I want Zulma inside that meeting or you know. Back to the committee. All right, back to committee. Is there a motion? I'll move approval. Second. Any other comments? If not, let's move to a vote. All right, the motion carries 5-0, and we'll be back on the 13th on that, on that topic. Uh, next one is uh, item two, the support for Proposition 1. Uh, Ryan, is Ryan? 
yeah, there you are. Come on down to whichever mic you'd like and uh, get us started. Good afternoon, uh, Vice Mayor, Council Members. My name is Ryan Coonerty. I'm a Senior Advisor to the Mayor for Intergovernmental Relations. Uh, I'm here today to talk about the support for Prop 1 uh, and the letter from the Mayor and Council Member Cohen. As you know, this is the only uh, measure that will be on the, this March's ballot. It's proposed by uh, G Gavin Newsom. It's supported by the legislature uh, and really seeks to reallocate the Mental Health Services Act's dollars um, into creating transitional housing, much needed transitional housing, almost uh, uh, more than 11,000 units across the state that will range from actual treatment beds to transitional beds uh, for a population that we currently see as deeply unserved. Uh, Judge Manley has talked about he has 50 people sitting in jail right now who are just waiting placement and treatment and there is nowhere for them to be placed. Uh, every day we see people on our streets who are, uh, who are un underserved or uh, simply not served by our current mental health system. This in combination with the care courts, conservatorship reform, and the other mental health uh, measures that have been enacted in recent years could go a long way to addressing the crisis we see on our streets and frankly the challenges that uh, impact the city from firefighting, police, parks, business development, and more. Um, I was prior to joining the mayor's staff. I was a county supervisor for eight years in Santa Cruz. Um, I'm very aware of how these mental health service dollars are allocated. This is these are not new dollars. These will be bonded uh, dollars. A portion of the current funding bonded for this housing, but we won't be able to address the crisis we see without um, this support. So thank you all for your consideration today. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Uh, we'll start with public comment. Jordan. Thank you. I wanted to ask the committee to at least discuss this and consider not approving it. Two reasons. One is just um, for utilitarian reasons. This, the yes on this measure has already gotten 10 million in support. The no's have gotten zero dollars. So it's most likely going to pass. So why bother spending staff time writing letters of support? Um, individual council members can still uh, write letters of support. Um, on behalf of themselves. Um, second, I've read some of the opposition uh, reasons and they, they seem like they have decent reasons for opposing. Um, and I just wanna read some snippets from what the League of Women Voters of California wrote. Um, they, they said a couple things. One, they said there's a critical need for better mental health, um, but there's some flaws in this one. Um, they said it was rushed through the legislature and they didn't have enough time to get um, discussions going with diverse community-based organizations um, regarding health care and civil rights. Um, and then they also say Prop 1 does not increase the overall funding for mental health services for counties. The bond money is to build treatment units and supportive housing. Under the changes this measure makes to the Mental Health Services Act, more of the money received by counties must be used for housing of certain group of patients and for intensive personalized support services like assistive find, funding empl finding employment and accessing educational opportunities. This reallocation reduces the funds available for other mental health services that counties currently offer to patients like treatment, crisis response, and outreach. It has the overall effect of reducing counties' ability to set priorities based on local needs for mental health services. Any variances that may allow counties to spend more or less on specific categories would increase their administrative costs and do not erase the lack of flexibility that they would have to meet specific needs. Finally, budgetary decisions should be made by legislature, not by earmarking funds through ballot initiatives. Thank you. Paul? Excellent, Jordan. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. Thank you for Paul, we can't hear you. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, cool. Thank you. Excellent, excellent work, Jordan. Thank you, thank you, thank you for showing up and chiming in, saying what you just said. This is a perfect example, and I, I already work with the county. I work with uh, Supervisor Lee's office. He's the one that runs. He he's the one that runs the show on these issues. So I don't just do city; I do county as well. So Supervisor Lee has done an excellent job, but he is hampered. You see, what you guys did is you pushed through this and supported this uh, this uh, conservatorship. You don't have the infrastructure right now to handle that. You do not have the infrastructure right now to handle it. 
And what you think you're going to do is under the under the guise of being moral and wanting to help these people, what you're doing is you're you're digging into a pot of money that is necessarily designated to treat mental illness, to treat alcoholism, to treat drug addiction. And you're taking monies away from that in order to get yourself out of this infrastructure deficit that you guys created when you guys instituted the three strikes you're outlaw, which is this city. This city instituted that three strikes you're outlaw. And what it did is it created a deficit. Why? Because you were too busy sending us to prison for things that required treatment, but you didn't do it because that wasn't the case back then. So there's a historical issue here that needs to be fully articulated within the context of this conversation. And it is that. So I'm sick and tired of you guys using the mental health issues that people experience on the streets in order to get yourself out of a jam, out of a housing jam. And what you're doing is you're digging into money that necessarily would be used in order to treat us, and you're using it in order to build places to warehouse us. Same thing as prisons, just a different name. That's disgusting. Blair? All right. Thank you. Very good public comment from both, both persons. I was going to say the exact same thing. Uh, mental health and conservatorship issues are a lot like jail issues. And um, we have to be very careful how we talk about these issues. I think after 9-11 events uh, in, at the local level, we, we went to a more uh, open progressive system of how to address mental health. And we're now trying to understand that better, which I don't doubt. I don't I, I, it's, it's okay that we're doing that, but we really, as we're doing that, have to be balancing the questions of, a, of the individual's human rights. Basically, we still have to continue that work. We can't just apply conservatorship to people. It has to be a balanced effort. San Diego, I think one of the main reasons why I moved down here, uh, when they do things like this, San Diego has been developing ways that the, that the uh, individual in question has a part in their therapy, in their questions of conservatorship, in their questions of housing and mental health therapy. Um, there, it's a really interesting program that for all the important work that um, uh, Supervisor Chavez and, and others of the County Board of Supervisors do, do, are doing right now, they, they need to find that balance. And I know they, they are trying to do that. And it's what San Diego is offering is that balance of human rights of the individual we have to think about that in all of our conversations with this. We have to know how to talk about that more openly. So uh, good luck how to do that with this sort of item. And uh, thanks for great public comment. And I hope we can all take it in. Thank you. Back to the committee. All right, thank you. Welcome back, Blair. Um, I wanted to um, just make a couple comments since I co-signed this memo. Um, what we hear from the, um, you know, from our providers and from the county is that the biggest impediment to pro providing mental health service is the lack of beds and the lack of place for people. Um, and so this is an attempt uh, to address that. It's a top priority for the governor and legislature this year. That's why it stands alone on the March ballot. Uh, we did endorse this as the board of the California League of Cities uh, after an extensive discussion a couple months ago. I'm comfortable um, moving this forward and bringing it at least to discussion of the full council and would hope that the council would, would approve it. Um, and um, I guess I'll just leave it at that and hear from my colleagues. Councilmember Jimenez. Yeah, thank you, Rick. Just a, a question for you. Uh, as you walk up, I'll ask the question. Curious w if the county has taken a position. This would obviously curtail and restrict a little bit their usage, it seems to me. Um, and I'm wondering if you can speak to what they've decided upon as it relates to this proposition. Sure. I'm sorry, I couldn't quite make out uh, so, the question. Yeah, sorry, let me take this off. I'm not sure that's better. So curious if you know if the county of Santa Clara has taken an official position on, prop, uh, on this proposition. And uh, if you do, if you can illuminate as to. I believe the county has not taken a position on this proposition that I'm aware of. OK. All right. And then Lee, if you have any. Thank you. So my understanding that the county is going to have that agendized in the next week and that they're currently in the process of taking a support position as part of that, but they have yet to take that position. All right, Councilmember Davis. Thank you. Uh, following on to that, I, I'm happy to make the motion. I, I would like this to go to the full council for discussion, and I would um, like it to come after it goes to the county so that staff can give us a report on the county's perspective and stance on this measure 
and we can have a discussion about the trade-offs um, to mental health services as a result of this. I, I don't know how, uh, what I think about this proposition yet. I haven't had time to do um, any research on it, which is why I declined to sign this memo. Um, and so I move that we send this to the full council with a, with a discussion um, that it doesn't go on consent and that we have a report from staff that gives the county perspective on this measure and um, a discussion of the trade-offs to mental health services in our county. Second. Yeah, that, it's a, that's a reasonable uh, approach just with the, with the context. And you're saying that the county might be doing this next week, you think? That's my understanding. Yeah. So we can agendize this for after the um, Board of Supervisors has taken action and staff's current thought process, the Legislative Analyst Office did a really good analysis of the proposition. So we would attach that when this comes forward to the full council because that's a pretty fair and independent source. And I would hope that we're not going to bring it back too much after February 6th since ballots go out on February 5th and you know the election's already happening by that point. So it would be great to take the position as soon as we can. But I certainly understand why we'd want the county to weigh in first. I will just make one other comment that from what I heard at the during the extensive discussions that we've had in various issues at the State League of Cities meetings, which is the frustration that many cities have around the state that a lot of this mental health money and other money is going to the county and there doesn't seem to be a lot of accountability that the state demands on counties on how it gets spent and when it gets spent and the urgency of spending it, which leaves the cities holding the bag a lot of the time for the um, all the issues that come up as a result of um, not having enough mental health treatment uh, and, and the county's not moving urgently enough. So this is one of the reasons why I think it's important to, to support this and it's not necessarily important to be aligned with the county if they don't <laughs> agree with it, but we'll see what they, what they say and what their reasoning is. Um, so let's move to a vote on this item. All right, that motion carries 5-0. Thank you for the motion. And now we're on to item three, preserving our progress in Guadalupe River Trail, and we'll start with Councilmember Davis. Uh, thank you. So um, this memo by myself and the mayor and Councilmember Torres is really about having a, having a no return zone for uh, the Guadalupe River Trail for the portions that um, the city implemented last fall with a $2 million grant um, from the state's ERF program. And that was to have outreach teams help move many of those residents into interim and permanent housing, including the Arena Hotel, which is on the Alameda in my district, and connect people to social services, of course, as part of that. Um, in addition, Caltrans and Beautify SJ workers um, work tirelessly to close the encampments in those areas and are continuing their efforts to restore the trail to its intended purpose, which is of course being a recreational and commuting zone for all San Jose residents and everyone in the area um, to come, to use it to come downtown. So what this memo is really doing, um, we, we talk about making a, a no return zone and really we're, we're calling for installing signage with posted park rules as required by law and um, including permanent ab abatement postings which would allow Beautify SJ and the relevant city departments to abate the area if it is re-encamped. All right and just to clarify our new procedure this as this is a memo that doesn't have a um, early consideration form this is in some sense a first reading where we determine we send it to staff to do an analysis and bring it back to a subsequent rules committee meeting to, for us to make a motion to move it on to council. Mm -hmm. um, so let's go to public comment first. We have in-person speakers. As I call your name, please go ahead and make your way down to the podium. And when you get to the mic, please state your first name so we could mark off that we had your turn. Eric, Rich, and David. Good afternoon, Chair Cohen, members of the committee. My name is Eric Shainauer, and I'm a resident in the Vendome neighborhood in downtown. For 35 years, I've lived within four blocks of the Guadalupe River, and I've trained for three marathons on that trail. I've trained for dozens of half marathons on that trail. I've taken my daughters for bike rides on the trail. I've pushed my grandmother in her wheelchair on walks on that trail uh, over those decades. Today, 
It's a place none of my neighbors want to go. It is infuriating, it's sad, it's scary, it's intimidating, depending on which neighbors giving their perspective. And so at some point, it all needs to be cleaned up. But at this point, uh, I want to thank Councilmember Davis and Councilmember Torres and Mayor Mahan for this recommendation because the city needs to start somewhere. <laughs> and this recommendation sets a place to start. And the city needs to have a more systemic approach for how to keep public places free of homeless people. And I, I've heard all council members talk on the subject, and I think you all agree. <laughs> and you all have areas in your district and parks in your district. Someday, we need to get to that point of success where our public spaces are clean and safe and free of homeless so that everyone can truly enjoy them. And I'm confident we'll get there someday. But I think this recommendation here is a good way to target an area that's highly visible. It's important to the downtown from an economic development and recreation standpoint, and to come up with a system that works here that can then be expanded to other areas of the city. So I hope you'll support it. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rich Turner, and I'm the director of exhibits and facilities at Children's Discovery Museum. We would like to thank all of you for the challenging work being done to compassionately help the unhoused, as well as to provide a safer and cleaner downtown that workers, residents, and visitors can be proud of. We are also grateful for the collaborative efforts to remove three unhoused compounds around the Children's Museum. This area was not appropriate for them and led to inhumane and unsanitary conditions. They were also detrimental to the staff and visitors because they were next to our designated parking lots. Prior to their relocation, the museum experienced daily, night and day occurrences of negative activity, drug use, vandalism, trespassing, theft, nudity, vulgar language, unleashed dogs, and verbal harassment created an environment that was scary for our staff and visitors, especially parents with little children. For example, our staff arrive each day to find evidence such as vandalism of our $20,000 ADA entry doors, multiple break-ins of our storage units, destruction of our irrigation systems, a $10,000 large window was smashed, a cinder block thrown through an employee's windshield, an employee chased from the parking lot, the theft of two catalytic converters from our vehicles, fuel lines vandalized to, in an attempt to steal gasoline, and AV equipment stolen directly out of our amphitheater. We know this is occurring and have video evidence from our addition of over 20 exterior video cameras showing individuals coming from these compounds, committing theft and vandalism, and then returning to the same compounds. On four different occasions, the great San Jose Police Department has retrieved video files from us to aid in homicide investigations that are nearby. We have consistently received negative feedback in person, on social media, and on business review sites. The public is concerned for their safety. The removal of the compounds has already had a positive impact on our staff and visitors. I'm no longer receiving calls in the middle of the night from our burglar alarm company. Children's Discovery Museum fully supports the no return zone in Discovery Meadow Park and Guadalupe River Park Trail as proposed. We're thankful to Mayor Mahan, Council Mr. Chair and members of the committee, um, you have a long agenda. You've heard from a lot of people. I'm not going to take two minutes. I do want to thank uh, especially Councilmember Davis for supporting this memo. This became uh, a project you had to take on with redistricting especially, but you'd already been working on homelessness, I know. Um, I really want to thank you for bringing this proposal forward and especially thank your staff who've done a tremendous amount of work day to day to make a real difference in this trail. And you can see it now. Uh, I did go to the press conference on s Saturday. It's amazing that anyone would have to camp in this area. It's a horrible, noisy place. One of the recommendations that came out of the Mayor's Transition Committee on Homelessness was to prevent re-encampments in unsafe areas. This is one of those areas. It's near a highway. There were burn marks on some of the off-ramps and on-ramps onto the 280-87 exchange. Um, something really needs to be done here to preserve the progress that was, that was made. So this is worthy of council discussion now. 
This has been well studied by staff. Please don't send that back to staff to have it come back to the committee to wait weeks again because time is of the essence to pr preserve the progress that's been made. Thank you. Moving on to virtual speakers, Paul. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Well, I'm sorry that your guys' eugenics program that you have, you know, adopting euthenics, but it's very telling that Eric Schoenhauer was here. That is very telling because he's part of this euthenics and not nothing to him personally. It's just what he's doing. He's participating in a process called euthenics. And what it, that means is, is that you create systems and it's done incrementally. So nobody like really notices the change. And what it does is you create economic and political systems that necessarily will include certain people because the horseshoe is being gentrified. And it's interesting to note that he lives in, in, in the barrio. I didn't know that, now I do. So now what he did is he's creating all these chess pieces because he's working on all of these projects. So basically what he's doing is he's gentrifying the people that have experienced the generational poverty from that particular district, Willow Glen. That's D11. This was the lowest resource barrio of all the barrios in that redlining map. I have that document. So you want to read it, Mr. Schoenauer? I'll send it to you. So now what, what we're dealing with here, I don't care about that laundry list of, of crime that Mr. Richard had quoted. I don't care about that because all of that is just symptomatic. Symptomatic of what? It's symptomatic of what people are experiencing on the streets. Deal with that. Deal with, the, deal with the issues related to poverty because homelessness is a symptom of poverty. It's not a condition in and of itself. It is symptomatic of a larger issue, and that is poverty. And when you look at the histories of all these people and the people that have been living in the barrios, I was one of those people living in that tent, and now I'm taking down statues. So there is potential inside the people that are inside the tents. So, I, so while I, I hear what you're talking about crime, you just named exactly what happened during. Blair. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman. Uh, I saw that you were having, uh, the mayor had a news conference about this on Saturday. I, I haven't viewed that yet. Uh, this issue has been of concern to myself. Uh, really good public comment from people to understand the situation. And uh, thank you. I mean, I really feel for uh, the people at Discovery Museum. Um, I think. Uh, there's a certain responsibility in being homeless that uh, you kind of have to respect how you know other people are living and, and learn to learn a process of cooperation, and that's um, that to me is the goal here of what we're learning. So thank to me, I'm 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 grateful that yourselves are bringing this item up now, going into a review, review process, and then we'll bring it back uh the rules and open government before going on to council thank you for that i think that's that's being uh, really decent of you and you can get uh you can gather in good ideas because i mean we, we have to learn cooperation with with this sort of thinking it can't be just so you can't just get rid of people you know uh, i mean we have to learn a, a good philosophy how to work on this and i think you know the, the beginning of some homeless issues actually works where there is cooperation between, you know, the homeless and, and, and people who have housing in, in, you know, in shared community spaces. And something starts off okay, and then something kind of declines in some places. In some places it's okay. Uh, I, we, I hope we can learn how to make it that balance. You know, I think that's the most important thing. Obviously, the, the description of the uh, Discovery Museum, uh, it's a real bad problem that's going on, it sounds like. It's, it's, it's out of balance. So good luck how to find that balance and uh, always want to be working towards it, I guess. That's my only uh, way to think about it. So, so thank you for this item. Jordan. Hi, Jordan Moldau, District 3. Um, I'm definitely conflicted on this item. Um, it sounds like you probably are potentially required to do this based off of the grant that was given um, and definitely acknowledging the, the improvements that have been seen. Um, I do just want to hone in on a couple of things I see in the memorandum. Um, one is it talks about doing abatement in a humane way. Um, I'd like to see that really expanded upon um, based on what I've heard from advocates and homeless individuals who come to open forum a lot for city council, 
many of San Jose's abatements are not done in a humane way. Um, and I've seen the notices in my own neighborhood um, that have gone up in advance of advance of abatements, and they don't seem very humane either. Um, so I really would like to dig into that. Um, and there also needs to be some sort of plan of how you're going to do that humanely um, when there isn't room in supportive housing. Um, you know, are you going to uh, put people in jail if they encamp there? Um, you know, that would be criminalizing homelessness, which I'm against. Um, are you going to create some sort of um, designated encampment area? Um, you know, we could discuss that, um, whether that could be done or not, and what, it, what the pros and cons of that would be. Um, also, an item two, enforcing park rules. Um, park rules in general, like some of them are good, some of them aren't. Like, it's by default, you're not technically allowed to be in parks more than half an hour after sunset or before sunrise, um, which basically me makes commuting impossible during a lot of the year. So I imagine you're not going to enforce that, which means you're only going to be selectively enforcing certain rules against certain people, which is also not just and not humane. So I'd encourage you also to dig into park rules and making more, more humane rules before you go through with this. Thank you. Mark. Hi, this is Mark Lewis, and I'm a D3 resident and also the chair of the Access Condominiums Neighborhood Association. As some of the council members are already aware, the Guadalupe River Park has been an area of interest and concern to our community for quite some time. Many of our community have been participating in improving conditions in the park and along the trail, as have city staff and departments. And we want to say that we applaud and support the efforts to create no return zones to help keep and sustain the progress that has been made in the Guadalupe River Park up to this point. Thank you. Back to the committee. All right, uh, we'll start with Councilmember Foley. Thank you. Uh, can you, uh, Lee, review with me what the referral process is that we adopted last meeting? I've forgotten the details of it. Sure, the rules committees, as this has come forward, can either drop the item that it shouldn't move forward or you can direct us to do a workload analysis and come back um, in two weeks or other time period um, with whether we can do that work and what the trade-offs are, um, if there are any. Okay, so my, my concern about this is the impacts on the other parts of the Guadalupe River if this uh, uh, zone is adopted, that it's going to, if we don't have housing for the people who are living there, they're going to go somewhere. And likely they're going to go further south on the Guadalupe, which puts them in other, other districts and other areas or north in other areas and or finds other creeks for them to live on. So it's not, we're not solving, this doesn't solve the problem. I understand what it does in the downtown area and it improves that area. And I appreciate the public comments, but the public comments that you made are ones that council members, all of us hear every day about the unhoused who are also along our creek beds and how they impact the residents with fires and crime and other issues that are occurring that are causing a lot of uh, concern. So I'm, 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 not, I'm not struggling with the item, I'm struggling with where it goes because it has an impact on what is happening as, as an example in the emergency interim housing and water resources protection zone of the Guadalupe down in uh, my area in District 9. So I'm wondering if staff has the time to review this and implement this immediately. So I'm tempted to refer it because I really like to know how this is going to affect the other efforts that we have going all along the, the river. 
Um, so before I make a motion, I guess I'd like to hear what everybody has to say, but I, I am very, this isn't just simply you pick up a tent and you move it and they're gone. You pick up the tent, they're gonna move and they're gonna come to another part of the river. We're already seeing that, that other areas that weren't heavily impacted are becoming more and more impacted. And, and it's either that or they go out into the neighborhoods and we, all, we don't want that as well. So this doesn't solve the problem and I appreciate um, the comments that we're gonna get there but I don't know that we're gonna get there in my lifetime. So I think we need to be more holistic and look at this from a bigger picture and not just one little st stretch of the Guadalupe. Uh, okay, Councilmember Davis. Thank you, Chair. Um, so Councilmember Foley, there is currently no one living in this stretch of the Guadalupe because $2 million of state money was spent to abate all of, the, all of the encampments that were in that area. And the, the idea of this is to simply change the, the postings to include that encampments can't be here anymore um, so that that $2 million is not wasted or is not used for just a short amount of time. So there's no one living there right now that would be cleared off to move. They've already moved and many of them have been um, moved into Arena Hotel. The idea about preventing uh, re-encampments, I think we have, to, I do think we have to start somewhere. Um, because we got a very large chunk of money from the state and Caltrans added signage to their portion of, uh, of just off the trail, um, their portion of property, and those have been pretty successfully not re-encamped. Um, that's basically what we're asking to do. Uh, if, we, if we need to refer it to staff for, for additional work, I can tell you that we've already discussed it with Olympia and she does want to change the signage on the, on the, um, on the trail so that it's really clear that that we're not allowing re-encampment. We will need to do that everywhere eventually. And the reason that we'll need to do it everywhere eventually, I've been through now a large cleanup in this area and before that a large cleanup along Columbus Park. We will have to prevent re-encampments everywhere because the fewer places there are for people to spread out and encamp, the more likely they are over time to take the housing that's offered to them. It is hard it is an unknown to move from outside when you've been outside for a long time to inside and a lot of what i have heard is a lot of the fear of that transition is being we're, we're basically giving that fear an outlet by not preventing re-encampment in other places in our city we are never gonna, if we, if we just offer housing but allow people to stay outside, we're never gonna get to the point where everybody comes inside. It's hard to do that. And there, and the, I just had conversations just last Friday with folks who are at Arena Hotel. It is definitely a transition to, become, to come inside. And that's why we have emergency shelter because they have caseworkers and they have workshops about doing your laundry and keeping your area tidy and how do you make your bed because all of those things are different than what it was when they were in survival mode outside. It's hard. Not everybody wants to do that and not everybody can get over that fear without having that this is the best place for you to go and guess what? We're, it's just not okay to stay outside. We, over time, we are gonna to have to do that and we're asking to start here so that we can see how, that, how it goes this way and how we can start to have that discussion about preventing re-encampment throughout the city. But we have to start somewhere. All right, Vice Mayor Kamei. Thank you. Many, many, many moons ago, while I was on the Water District Board, I remember how beautiful uh, the Guadalupe Trail had been and uh, how uh, 
you know, way back when, when uh, uh, Shirley Lewis had the vision of, you know, having a water feature uh, in the downtown uh, came about. Uh, it, was, it was gorgeous. It was absolutely gorgeous. People really found it to be a very pleasant, uh, safe place. Uh, when the um, Children's Discovery Museum came in, and uh, those of us who've been around a long, long time remember how that had been. And to have it go from that to something that is truly dangerous, and, and, and it's dangerous even for the unhoused people, right? Uh, I think that um, this, this offers a way in which we can begin to narrow the alternatives in terms of trying to get some unhoused into uh, either emergency interim housing or temporary housing or you know sort of in that getting getting more assistance because I think that uh, it's too easy uh, for someone to to you know not want housing and say no nope, I like it out here and I want to be out here and yet you know all of the um, conditions that are that are being generated in terms of the waste and and everything else that goes with living outside uh, is dangerous and I and I think that we need to begin to think about uh, what other ways can we um, encourage going into you know sort of transitioning into some of the housing transitioning into getting uh, mental health assistance or other kinds of assistance um, uh, this I think is a is a is a good start we don't want to move the problem from one section to just down the down the way uh, I think we recognize that but I but I also think that the way in which things are now really need to improve you know once an area is abated uh, it's really a shame to just have it regenerate again and I think that um, this is an opportunity to allow it to, to see, you know, what can we do and how we can, you know, help it. Um, not to move the problem upstream or whatever. Uh, and I think that, you know, we do have partners. I'm sure that the Water District and others, Caltran and, and others, um, uh, would be, you know, good collaborators to try to find solutions on, on some of these things, especially on really dangerous corridors near highways and, and um, things like that. So I think that, um, thank you, uh, Council Member Davis, that this is, this is at least a start. Okay, um, I see your hand went back up, but I'm gonna make some comments too, and then I'll come back to you. Um, I, I do think it's important that once we put the effort into cleaning up an area that we make sure not to be allowing things to get back out of hand again, because that's, that that's it becomes a waste of resources, and we need to do that. And and I will also point out that while this one's more public because of the nature of this location, this does happen in other locations. I mean, we have a really bad spot in my district that we just cleaned out last month because it was a similar situation as what was along Guadalupe River, and it was right next to a whole series of houses okay. where the people who were doing the things that were described were doing it along in people's porches along their front yards. And so we did clear that one out. Um, and we've had a lot of discussion internally about what we're gonna do to make sure it stays that way. And, um, um, you know, we didn't necessarily bring anything to council to make it official, but we're doing those things in various locations. But I do wanna also make sure that we're being real, you know, being, facing reality a little bit too and, and not being a little, as more, more, poly, as more Pollyannish than we should be. The way I describe this to the residents of my district, and I will, I will say I believe right now, and based on the, the problems that we're dealing with in District 4, that other than the area and the environment around downtown, District 4 probably has you know, a, one of the worst issues going on. And what, when we move people, it's like squeezing a balloon. So you squeeze the balloon, you clear out an area, and the balloon expands somewhere else. What you end up with is a density in, a certain, in each area that's too high to maintain a safe and secure environment. Now, while, while, while there's a lower density of people, it's something you can kind of manage, but when you get above a certain density, it becomes worse. And so I made this point right here on this dais when we, taught, when we signed a contract to clean out Coyote Creek because the water district was, is beginning to do work to shore up the, le the, the, the uh, creek bed. Um, I, I said, when we do this, we're going to end up with these people all on Penitentia Creek. 
The result, of course, and for those people that are in my area, they don't walk Guadalupe River, they walk Penitentiary Creek Park, and, and they, these, this encampment along Penitentiary Creek became an issue there. And it got worse when we cleared Pita Creek, just as I imagined it would. And we just cleared now this one portion of Penitentiary Creek, and now the eastern portion of Penitentiary Creek, closer to Allen Rock Park, has a growing homeless encampment. So I just want to be clear with everyone that as we do this, until we have enough locations, until we really have enough places to offer everyone, this is happening. So I just don't want to be naive about it um, as, we, as we make this, the, as we do this. Now we do have to, and sites where we've cleaned up, make sure they stay clean. So I support this action, but I, I just also want us to be thinking about what it is we're doing as we, be, as we clear more spaces. And it's the difficult conversations we have with the residents. Yes, this is a bad area, we clean it up. You're just gonna have another bad area in the neighborhood next door and you're gonna still be experiencing it. So I think that's what those of us who don't necessarily represent the downtown core are concerned about, that we're pushing people out into the other parts of the city and um, having a lifestyle effect across the city when we do this. Um, and, and you know, I guess that, that's part of the point. I mean, Councilmember Davis mentioned the fewer places there are, the more incentive there is to move. The fewer places there are, in the meantime, before we have more places for them to move, the more difficult some areas we have become. That's actually what's happening in the shorter term. The good news is that in the council agenda that we just approved on February 6th, we are bringing forward a contract to sign with VTA to, to begin the process of building our 200 beds at Cerrone. Um, I've been telling my residents, wait till the Cerrone site's open because when that opens, we will focus on all these folks that are, that are we're scattering around District 4. Um, they will have a place to be offered to go so that we can begin to say, now you got a spot, now you can't stay here. Um, but I just wanted to sort of add that extra context to this conversation because it's difficult for all of us to have this conversation about here's an area, we're gonna keep it clean while we're all fighting for areas all across the city and trying to make sure all of our communities are safe. Um, but I appreciate uh, this approach. And, and honestly, you know, the signs are an important step because at some point we're going to have to enforce um, these rules once we have the places for everyone to go, which I'm optimistic that hopefully in my lifetime we will, uh, we will have an option, but it'll, it'll take a while. As I've said, it's, this problem's been decades in the making and it's not something we're gonna be able to deal with in you know, a year or two. It's gonna take a long time before we get to that point. All right, Councilmember Foley. I want to thank you all for your comments, and I don't disagree with, with any of them. Uh, the reason I mentioned it is just because of what Councilmember Cohen said, that, that we solve the problem here. We do a cleanup on our creek, and a month later it's re-encamped and there's nothing we can do about it. And, and not only that, it gets bigger and bigger. And as other areas, like the balloon analogy, that was a good one, they do, they're, they're going someplace because we don't have any place to house them yet. And so it, it's a, it's a two-pronged solution. We have to absolutely build more interim housing and affordable housing, permanent affordable housing, and convert hotels and whatever Whatever strategies we have, we need to use every tool in our toolbox to solve it. Um, so I, I appreciate the eight, the 10 in this. What I don't wanna lose in our conversation is that this is happening all over on the rivers, and the river and the creek, and this should not be the end, it should be the beginning. And it, it what I, I also don't wanna hear is a delay on the EIH that's gonna be built down in my area that will make that creek area or that river area much more beautiful and accessible. And you're right, it's gorgeous. When it's cleaned up, it's beautiful. And we want our residents to feel safe on the creeks. We absolutely do. We want them to bike and ride and be um, communing with nature, but uh, we want that all over, not just in the downtown area, and that's the point I'm trying to make, that, that we really need this solution everywhere, and we need to prioritize this solution everywhere. So with that, I will move, do I just move the memo? Can I have a response? Um, sh sure. Okay, okay, Councilmember then Davis, uh, move, move <laughs> Davis make a motion when she makes her comment. Thank you. Uh, yeah, no, I completely agree. And, and I, I, look, 
my neighborhood, they, they moved closest to where they were before. They moved south and actually in my neighborhood. They're on Willow, a lot of people who got, got moved off of uh, the Guadalupe River Trail between uh, the Discovery Museum and, and Julian moved south to Willow and Lalong. Willow and Lalong is four times bigger, about four times bigger than it was before this, this happened. Um, and some of them moved north to, to Autumn Parkway. Um, so I am, I'm not saying by any means that, that, we should, that we should only focus on this area. This was meant to be, and I don't know if it got taken out of the, of the language, but we were saying a no return zone pilot originally in original drafts. I don't know if that word pilot got taken out, but the idea is that when we when we do really large abatements, this is let's we're just putting a, a stake in the ground and saying we're not going to re-encamp them. We're we're starting here. There is no Councilmember Torres and I are under no illusion that this is the only place this should happen. And and frankly, I mean, Councilmember Torres and I both in in both of our districts still have massive encampments in other areas that we wish. I mean, I even got a call on on Saturday afternoon or Sunday afternoon saying, "Well, that that's great, but you didn't you didn't include Autumn Parkway." And Autumn Parkway has a dozen tents. And I'm like, yeah, I know, I know. And I asked about that because it's right adjacent. And we wanted to be really clear about something that's already had been cleaned. Um, and, and really want, you know, I don't want this to slow down any other EIHs, but I think those are different, I think those are different teams that are working on those things. EIHs are housing and public works, and this is really parks and signage. Um, so what, what I would, would really like, uh, we, we, we have the option, right, of moving it to the full council or def delaying it two weeks, right? I don't think at this point you need to move it to the full council. Or, or so you, you I'm saying we have the option to do one or the other, right? I believe so. Yeah. Okay. Um, what I what I would like to do is really I'd like to have this discussion with the full council about honestly just the concept of no return zones. We haven't had a full discussion about it. Let this be our our discussion about preserving our progress. We start with the Guadalupe River Trail. We move. I, I'm open to having a, a larger discussion about it as well. Um, so I, I would, I move that we move this to the full council um, in the next two or three weeks. Second. That gives staff some time. Yeah, so let me I <clears throat> ask that question. Interesting point about, I mean, if we're gonna, if we believe that we're going to move it to full council at some point anyway, and we give ourselves time before it comes back to full council for the analysis to be done, do we really need to have the interim step of coming back here? Or can you get that analysis done and just bring it to the full council? For this or every well, item? Well, for this. I mean, we'll, we'll just say for this item now. Yeah, no, I, I think if we have two or three weeks to do that. Um, for the full council, um, we do have sunshine requirements that we post um, quite a bit in advance. So I, I need to check with the team and see when that analysis can happen because I do think there are, what I'm hearing is that um, the analysis of, of where these people may or may not go, I think the background of how this abatement went is, is critically important. And then the, the same team, part of the same team that would be enforcing the no encampment zone also goes to other areas of the city and abates. And that's an analysis that needs to happen. I think this location is pretty unique um, in that it has dedicated bike and foot patrol from the police department. Um, even with that dedicated uh, resource, which is, you know, they've been prioritized on this, and it, it's, uh, it's been difficult. So uh, I think those are the things you guys are asking for. So we're fine coming to council as long as we have two or three weeks um, um, with those sunshine requirements so that we can do the work. I think we can try and paint a better picture for you, even though there are an awful lot of unknowns because we're experimenting here. Okay. All right, we have a motion and a second, so let's move to a vote. All right, that motion carries 5-0. So we're on to the final part of our agenda, which is open forum. 
We have some in-person speakers. Again, as I call your name, please make your way down to the podium. Sharona and public speaker with last name Gomez. Hola, con, señores concejales. Este, mi nombre es Severiana Raimundo. Yo trabajo en dos compañías, en dos McDonald's de aquí de San José. Necesitamos que nuestros horarios sean respetados, favorab, favoritismo y represarias están agos, acos, acosando nu, en nuestro bienestar financiero. Lu, lugares en donde trabajo tóxico donde el favoritismo decide de si obten, obtendrán suficientes horas de trabajo que necesitamos es que hecho que es justo para que tra, trabajadores como yo no tengamos que trabajar dos trabajos para pagar la renta para que trabajadores como yo no tengan que pedir citas de doctores para doctor que sean tan importantes. Gracias por su apoyo, Coin, concejales, gracias, Coin, muchas gracias por su apoyo. Vamos a mejorar las vidas de miles de personas en nuestra ciudad con, nos, con su apoyo. Muchas gracias. Good afternoon, council members. I will now translate for the worker. Hello, council members. My name is Severania, and I work at the two McDonald's stores in San Jose. One of my jobs is supposed to be full-time, but I am regularly sent home early. And my hours are constantly cut, so I have to pick up a second job at another McDonald's part-time. It is stressful to commute via bus from one, from one job to another in one day. Even though the restaurants is always full and busy, they're always cutting the workers' hours. This hurts my ability to live in San Jose, and I'm constantly having to ask for extra hours for my second job so I can pay my rent in full. Fast food workers across San Jose need better scheduling so we, have, so we don't have to work two jobs and worry about making enough to pay rent because of our hours get constantly cut. We need your help making this a law. We cannot trust the industry that they will listen to us. They have shown us and continue to show us that their profits are more important than their workers. Please continue supporting fast food workers in San Jose to improve our jobs. Thank you. Hola, concejales. Mi nombre es Daisy Xiomara Gómez eh, Pérez, eh, trabajo en McDonald's. Estoy aquí porque los trabajadores de comida rápida en todo San José necesitan de su ayuda. En nuestra industria de comida rápida, muchos trabajadores uh, no defienden sus derechos en el trabajo. A veces es porque la conocen y a veces es porque no la conocen. Pero como trabajador de comida rápida, he sido testiga de la cultura de nuestra, que nuestra industria intenta generar. Los supervisores, los managers, actúan agresivamente con los trabajadores. Por ejemplo, nos gritan, nos discriminan y pues a veces nos dicen que ya no nos necesitan y que nos larguemos a nuestro break. Creo que esas cosas no se tienen que estar pasando dentro de nuestra comunidad eh, de la comida rápida. Se aprovechan de los trabajadores que no conocen sus derechos. 
y especialmente cuando somos o son inmigrantes, porque saben que todo en este país es nuevo. Quisiera imaginarme una industria donde todos los trabajadores de la comida rápida reciban un entrenamiento, que sepan de sus derechos, una industria donde los trabajadores se sientan seguros para poder denunciar sobre el abuso que tienen de las injusticias, una industria donde todos los trabajadores se sientan dignos de poder llegar y poder desempeñar el trabajo que tenemos. Ahora más que todo, la industria ha maltratado, ha manipulado y nos ha perjudicado a todos los trabajadores durante demasiado tiempo. Por eso ahora vengo delante de ustedes hablando, porque sé que con su ayuda de cada uno de ustedes, podemos convertir estos empleos en buenos empleos para nosotros. Gracias por todo su apoyo hasta ahora. Espero que sigan continuándonos y también agradeciéndole a Cohen por la ayuda que, ha, que nos ha brindado hasta este momento. Muchas gracias. I will not translate for Daisy Gomez. Hello, council members. My name is Daisy Gomez, and I work at McDonald's. I am here because fast food workers across San Jose need your help. In our industry, many fast food workers don't defend their rights on the job. Sometimes it's because they don't know their rights, and other times they know their rights, they know their rights, but they're scared. But as fast food workers, I have witnessed the culture our industry tries to breed. Supervisors act aggressive toward workers. For example, they'll yell, I don't need you here anymore. Your presence is bothering me. Go on break. They take advantage of workers, and we don't, and those who don't know their rights, especially when they're immigrants, because they know that coming into this country could be unsafe to them if they don't follow the laws or the rules of the company. I imagine an industry where all fast food workers are trained on their rights, an industry where workers feel safe to speak up against injustices, an industry where workers feel worthy of being respected is what San Jose strives for. The industry has mistreated, manipulated, and run workers for too long. That is why I speak up, because I know that with your help, we can make these jobs into good jobs. Thank you for all your support, Council Member Cohen. Please continue to stand with us and every other council member. Thank you. Moving on to virtual speakers, Jordan. Jordan Moldau, District 3. I wanted to speak a little bit about uh, document transparency. Um, I know that San Jose has been in the news over the last few years for lawsuits relating to failure to disclose certain things. Um, and I'm, although I'm not familiar, I do remember reading about um, actions to make it harder for um, people to make uh, requests for documents. Um, and I'd like to urge the uh, council to consider making it easier for people to see certain documents. Um, not necessarily like emails and stuff like that, but for example, engineering design documents and things like that. Um, you know, if, if a concerned citizen wants to see, you know, one example is a, a cyclist I know wanted to find out the details for the new extension to the Coyote Creek Trail and, you know, had to do a lot of asking around to try and find the plans. And I don't even know if they've succeeded yet. Um, you know, that wastes their time. It wastes staff's time to answer those questions. If it was the policy of the city to just put all these documents on, you know, the portal where people could find them, I feel like that would make for a much more transparent government and also would just eliminate a certain category of waste. Um, similarly, I was trying to see some documents related to VTA project, um, and I also needed to do a bunch of back and forth uh, with staff in order to be able to see those documents um, if those were just already available on the portal for everyone to see um, a lot of back and forth could have been avoided. Uh, so again, I'd encourage San Jose to consider doing more to make more categories of documents always available. And in your positions on the board of directors of VTA and other boards, I think you should do the same in those organizations as well. Thank you. Paul. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Yo, yo escucho tu palabra, señora, y de 
de personas en, de, de San José, de comida, de construcción y de janitorio y todos trabajadores, necesitamos un huelga. Un huelga este, este, necesitamos ahorita, porque del, 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 uh, del gabachos, y si tienes de fuerza, no escuche, no escuche nada, pero de huelga sí escuchen, sí escuchen de huelga. De huelga está bien para cesar, de huelga sí está bien para de dolores, huerta, y de huelga y sí está bien para de ahorita, de personas y de tra trabajadores, ahorita está bien. What I just stated is that the strike is necessary. That's what we need. We need to strike. And we need to show you and bring this government down to its knees. And the way that we do that is with our bodies. You see, Cesar Chavez showed us the way. And he showed us that our greatest asset is our body. And all we have to do is just not work. If the, all the construction sites, if all of the food service industry, if all the janitorial workers just put down their tools, just put down everything, all at one time, just like we had about 20 years ago, over 100,000 people, over a, the, one of the largest kinds of walkouts ever occurred right here in San Jose. I think we need that again. I think we need to show this construction industry, we need to show this food industry, that you know what, the power lies in the people. The power does not lie in you. Viva la huelga. Blair? Hi, I'll be uh, good public meeting today. I could comment all around. Everyone, thank you. Uh, I wanted to comment at City Council last week. Uh, there was an item where we described that uh, because of COVID, uh, gentrification issues are really happening in San Jose, and a lot of uh, uh, lower income people are moving out and it's becoming uh, just a higher income place in San Jose. Uh, those are the exact sort of words that Paul has like continuously been talking about for years now, and maybe not quite in you know, COVID happening, maybe not quite as soon or as the way he quite offered, but it is happening. And um, it's important we work towards uh, equity. Good luck in, in continuing the efforts, uh, inviting people. Paul really is going to ask questions and, and asking the current equity uh, office staff, you know, just having sessions with them, you know, just hanging out with them, just talking as much as he can. Uh, from, from that meeting, it was also brought out that uh, uh, the issue of uh, retrofitting and, and soft story. And uh, I thank you that you are trying to develop uh, education practices. Uh, Ross and Huey reported uh, you know, for the past six months, they've been trying to do that. Uh, a lot of things can be safe. Very nice warnings from uh, Councilperson Kame, who also really suggested that there's a lot of concern going on. Uh, it just made so clear to me how much education can be in help, in help at this time. Good dialogue, good understanding, so this doesn't have to happen. And we have to be clear how this doesn't have to happen. Good luck as city government. You can make clear to owners that they don't have to be uh, force people out. We can be, you know, this can be a good practice, a good thing. Let's try to do our best. Back to the All right, we are adjourned at 3.29 p.m.